Hi, and welcome to this webinar on controlling canker worms in North Carolina. My name is David Fogarty. I am the Gaston County Extension Director and serve with the North Carolina Cooperative Extension Service, which is an outreach of NC State University and NC a t Universities in all 100 counties in the, in the state. I'd like to give some credit in this presentation to our friends in Charlotte, Mecklenburg and Fairfax County, Virginia. I borrowed a couple slides from them because they have been dealing with this canker worm problem for the past few decades and have some resources on that. Here in Gaston County, we have been dealing with this in an in increasing fashion for the past, say, five or six years. Usually you will uh, first discover canker worms in the springtime in late March, early April, when these little inchworms will start dropping down on your head from the trees and their droppings, as well as they eat the food, eat, the, eat your trees, their droppings fall on your plants and on the driveways and then it rains and gets slick and you're slipping and sliding. Um, and it's quite a nuisance. So that's your, the first time you come in contact with them. And then um, you'll find also, even if you don't have trees in your yard, that maybe your neighbors have trees and these little inchworms will come flying across on a windy day on a thread of silk uh, from your neighbor's trees and land on your house or in your yard. Um, and we get calls all the time where people say, I don't have trees in my yard, so why do I have these? Um, but it, you need to work as a neighborhood really to solve this problem uh, because the, tr the canker worms can travel hundreds of yards on these threads. In addition to being a nuisance, these, uh, the canker worms cause damage to our trees. And that damage occurs, as I said, in late March, early April, when the leaves first come out. The eggs hatch and the canker worms start to feed on the trees and within two or three days, they can defoliate an entire tree. Um, and usually they will, um, the canker worms have a, about a, maybe a three week period where they are causing damage in that early springtime period. So a, the damage to your trees in one year is typically not going to kill your tree. However, over time, if this happens repeatedly and the, each year your tree has to produce a, a whole new set of leaves and expend that extra energy, and that stress combines with other stressors like uh, a drought condition or extreme heat during the summer or maybe other pests or disease or disturbances, it definitely can contribute to the poor health of the tree and can uh, cause the death of the tree over time. Trees are expensive to remove, so we will take a look at that in a minute. And again, the in addition to the damage to the tree, these canker worms are just a nuisance. So is it worth your while to address this problem? And one thing people are not aware of is just how much a tree is worth. This diagram here shows the value to society as a whole um, of a, of a full-grown tree. A stormwater runoff reduction is worth $11,000. Carbon dioxide reduction, a couple thousand dollars. Energy savings, over $15,000. Air quality improvement, a couple thousand dollars. But also, just to yourself, you see that uh, property value increase over $20,000. Some large trees are definitely worth that and would cost that much to replace. So your tree is a valuable part of your property and uh, so you do wanna take efforts to prevent its demise from canker worms. One question we often get is which trees do canker worms prefer? Well, their preference for laying their eggs is on oak trees, ashes, beeches, and maples, but they will consume just about everything. Um, so 
they will lay their eggs, even if they lay their eggs, say, on a, an oak tree or a maple tree, they will drop off of those or swing over on those threads and get on apples, elms, birches, hickories, cherries, dogwoods, roses, any, any kind of shrubs, uh, all kinds of things in your yard and will devour those. I've heard of them uh, getting on blueberries as well. Um, so they, they are not partial to what they're eating. They are somewhat partial to where they lay their eggs. There are some trees that are resistant to canker worms um, that canker worms will not mess with. Uh, pines, any kind of variety of pine or conifer or cypress or cedar. Um, the uh, holly trees, southern magnolia have waxy leaves, any kind of evergreen. Uh, basically, canker worms are looking for trees and plants that are producing new leaves at the beginning of the year. You also see uh, on this slide, uh, yellow poplar, um, another one is sweet gum, that uh, they don't seem to like the taste of those. Over on the bottom right-hand corner, you've got a crepe myrtle there. Their leaves come out later so um, than when the canker worms are active, so they are immune to damage from canker worms. Interesting to note that the a lot of our problems when it comes to uh, pests in North Carolina, a lot of these problems are imported. They're not native to North Carolina. You think of things like kudzu and the kudzu bug and uh, fire ants um, and uh, stink, stink bugs um, are all imported problems. But the fall canker worm is actually native to Eastern North Carolina or Eastern North America and uh, runs all the way from Canada down to Texas. And as a native insect, it also has natural predators in the environment. And we'll take a look at those on the next uh, slide. In Charlotte, they have, as I mentioned, they have dealt with this problem for over 25 years um, and are still trying to figure out exactly why that problem exists there. Um, I think part of it is just the environment in an urban setting. As I mentioned, uh, there are some natural predators for the canker worms. Uh, there are migratory birds that consume canker worms. There are beetles. Uh, there's this little wasp that lays its eggs in the egg of a uh, canker worm. Uh, after the canker worm um, female lays the eggs, the, this wasp comes along and lays its eggs in there and they hatch and devour when the the uh, wasp uh, larva hatches, it devours the canker worm. So that's kind of a Halloween uh, little story there. Um, so there are these natural predators um, in, an, in a natural setting where they can control the canker worms. However, in our urban settings, we often have monocultures. We just have a few different species. You look at downtown Charlotte and you've got uh, you know, streets lined with willow oaks and water oaks and all kinds of uh, urban trees. Um, and even in yards, you have in, in urban areas in Gaston County, um, in Lincoln County, I think Denver's having some problems with, uh, with these canker worms. You'll see a lot of maples and oaks planted in, uh, in lawns and uh, on streets. And as we noted, those are preferred trees for canker worms to lay their eggs. Fortunately, canker worms have a weakness, and that weakness is shown right here. You see on the right-hand side a male female, a male canker worm moth that has wings. And on the left side, you see a female canker worms that has no wings. And that lack of wings on the female is the weakness that canker worms have that we will try to exploit in controlling them. And that is some good news. So here is the full life cycle of the fall canker worm. And we'll start at the left-hand side over here 
April through November, and we're in November right now. So these, the canker worms are in the pupa stage. They are underground, about two to three inches underground. They are very safe. They have made these little cocoons, these pupa, that um, are have shells around them. They use that thread, that silken thread, and they weave it in with some soil and make a crust, a uh, shell that, that protects them as they are going through metamorphosis and changing from a caterpillar into a moth. They emerge in the winter time. And you see up at the top there, the female on the left and the male with wings on the right. They emerge in sometime in the the uh, period of December, typically through February, and it really all depends on the weather when it gets cold. That's when they emerge. They lay their eggs soon after that. They climb up the trees, uh, they mate, and the female lays eggs up on the tops of the trees. And then those eggs hatch uh, and become our nemesis, the inchworm uh, cankerworm caterpillar in the springtime in late March, early April. Again, so here's a review. Adults emerge from the pupa stage after the first hard freeze. We'll take a look at that temperature in just a minute. The females climb the trunk of the tree, mate and lay their eggs, and the eggs hatch in the early spring. The good news is, is that the only damage that the canker worms do to the, our trees is in the springtime when they're eating the leaves. The moths and the pupa stage uh, do not harm anything. So again, going back to the temperature, these, uh, the, the adults emerge from the ground when it gets cold. And how cold does it need to be? Well, it, uh, the, the rule of thumb is that after temperatures drop below 30 degrees for two to three consecutive nights, then the canker worms are gonna start emerging. Um, that is just a rule of thumb. It really varies from year to year, and it depends how cold it gets and for how long. Um, if you had two nights where it got down to say, 22 degrees and the soil temperature started really uh, being affected, then your canker worms are going to start emerging. It, if you had it down to maybe 29 degrees and it, for three days, maybe they, the temperature in the soil hasn't dropped enough. Um, the, they have not figured out, scientists have not quite pegged a, uh, a soil temperature where they emerge, but there's a guy, uh, Jack McNeary in Charlotte, who if you look up his webpage, he has done a, just a lot of independent study uh, on canker worms and has logged all this information uh, online for people to look at. He has targeted a soil, te soil temperature of around 45 degrees as uh, a time when the canker worms will start emerging. And again, I meant say they will start emerging then because they won't all come out the next day. Uh, they will start emerging and it may, they may emerge from the ground over the next four to six weeks. So again, we're talking about controlling canker worms. And um, that control can come in the springtime. If you forget to address them when they have their weakness in the fall, then you are stuck with trying to treat them in the springtime uh, when they are, they are the uh, inchworms dropping all over you. And if you can imagine trying to treat uh, trees that are 60, 80 feet tall, that's gonna be quite a challenge. If you do decide to treat in the springtime, your best bet is a product called BT, Bacillus thuringiensis. It is a bacteria that is considered organic. It does not harm pets or people. Um, so, you can spray this. It is a contact uh, pesticide, so you can spray it. It does need to come in contact with the uh, canker worms, and it will infect them within a couple days, and they will die. 
there's a couple of brand names, uh, Thuricide, Dipel, there's some others that uh, are this VT product. Um, again, that's going to be hard to apply, but you might be able to apply it on shrubs and plants that are being eaten by the canker worms at the ground level if you have a, a sprayer or a backpack sprayer. You could use some other products um, like Seven. That's not a great choice because it is uh, a, a more toxic chemical. It's going to hurt the bees that are out. It's the, uh, the BT product only affects caterpillars. So the city of Charlotte has been uh, in the past uh, using BT in an aerial application um, back in the around 2008, I think it's the last time they sprayed with an aerial ap application. Um, and that has to go through a lot of approval processes through the city, state, and EPA. Uh, and it also only has an effect for 48 hours, so they have to do multiple sprays. Um, so it is a rather expensive uh, proposition to take that approach. It's interesting to look at the city of Charlotte and because they have been monitoring canker worms for a while. Um, and this map here shows on the left 2013 where you had some higher rates of canker worms. If you look at the darker, larger circles, those indicate the higher rates of canker worms. So in 2013 on the left, you had some high rates up in the university area on, in the northwest and some over on the west side, uh, out, looks like Albemarle Road there, a couple of large uh, blue dots there. On the 2014 map, it appears that the primary population has actually moved down here, down south. Um, compare that over here in 2013. So the population has moved down in this area and also increased in the western part and really 2014 was the first year that we had really bad conditions in Gaston County which is located further over here uh, across the Catawba River. So um, you can see from year to year the problems do ch um, with canker worms do uh, tend to change. Again, I, I, yeah, I mentioned the cost of spraying airily um, with planes. The, they spent in 2008 $1.5 million uh, spraying um, for canker worms. Uh, so it's quite an expensive proposition and not one that uh, they have repeated in the past uh, few years and that we would probably do here in Gaston County. The better approach and one that uh, is, is recommended across the board is banding your trees in the fall when the adults emerge. So if we can put a band around the tree and put this sticky tanglefoot material on the band, then the female that remember has no wings is gonna crawl up the tree and get stuck on this band and will not lay her eggs in your tree. And that is the simple process of uh, stopping canker worms. So there are three steps to preventing or, or to uh, banding your tree. The first is to put a cotton or insulation strip around the tree and staple that on there. And that is to, to fill in some of the grooves and gaps in the tree bark so that the female moth will not crawl under your band. The second step is to apply tar paper, and uh, you can buy that at uh, any hardware store, and cut it into maybe a six inch strip and put that on top of the cotton banding, which is underneath. And finally, then you apply the tangle foot material, which is the sticky material that will catch the female canker worm. So this is a picture right here of the female canker worm, um, adult, and she can crawl up through crevices. So that is why you need that cotton or insulation banding on your larger trees with deep bark. So here is a uh, another demonstration 
of the steps in banding. First step up here, you want to staple on a band of cotton batting or insulation that is going to fill in those gaps in the trees. The second, staple on the uh, roofing paper, tar paper. And the third step down at the bottom is to apply the tangle foot. Um, and you can do that with a, uh, with a, a I like to use paint sticks because uh, you can dispose those, but you want to do a thin layer about an eighth of an inch uh, around there. Uh, again, we need to consider when to do this and we want to do it when the canker worms, adult canker worms are emerging from the ground. So remember the temperature. So, you, so what you want to do is to hurry up and wait. So go ahead and put the cotton batting on, put the tar paper on, and then wait until, so you have everything ready to go, um, your trees are banded, and then wait until uh, as long as possible to apply the tangle foot. Because if you put the tangle foot on right away and leaves are still on the trees, uh, as they are right now, and the, the leaves start dropping, they're gonna get caught on your tangle foot, on your bands, and then the, the female canker worm can just crawl up over the, your band because it's covered with leaves, and they can walk across the leaves rather than get caught on the sticky material. There are some alternatives to that standard process. Um, if you have a smaller tree, um, especially one with smooth bark, you could use plastic wrap and just wrap the tree in the plastic wrap. You see that down in the bottom picture here. If you do that, be sure that you uh, are that the tree doesn't have grooves or uh, a, a odd formation that would allow when you wrap that uh, plastic wrap around it, allow space between the plastic wrap and the tree. You see in this picture, you're able to put a stick or, an, or a uh, Sharpie there down through there. If, if that can get through there, certainly a, an adult female could crawl under there. So um, putting cotton banding around there or only using this when you have uh, trees that are, are fairly round. Um, also, another useful tool is duct tape or Gorilla Tape. Um, as a way of sealing the edges of your uh, tar paper, especially on the bottom, that would keep canker worm uh, adults, the females, from crawling up under your banding. And it's also um, on smaller trees a good idea to use the duct tape or gorilla tape instead of staples, because um, a tree with really thin bark, um, if you put lots of staples in it, that could uh, damage the bark and cause a place where uh, disease and pests could enter. So what products are available? This is a product, uh, a little kit that Keep Gastonia Beautiful has put together. It includes a uh, container of Tanglefoot, uh, I think it's a 15 ounce container, um, some cotton batting, some felt, a putty knife, uh, instructions, and they have about 25 feet of the banding, which they estimate is enough for five large trees. I would, uh, it's maybe enough for five at the most. Um, you know, it depends how large your trees are. Um, so, but it, it, if you have just like, you know, two or three trees in your yard that you want to band, this is a easy way to get started. Um, everything's put together. This was being sold at Southern States in Dallas. I know they also sell them at the farmer's market in Gastonia. And you see the phone number there, 704-866-6906 uh, uh, for Keep Gastonia Beautiful. You can contact them directly for those kits. If you're looking at a larger job, you've got multiple trees in your yard, or you're gonna work as a neighborhood, you might consider buying a full gallon. Um, the price for that 15 ounces is around 10 to $12 for that, uh, if you buy the um, container 
in a hardware store. If you can find the gallon um, container, that is only uh, 45 to $50 and would uh, do, I'd have to do the math on that. It's about five times as much product. So, um, you know, you're probably going to end up needing that much material if you're, if you're looking at multiple trees. Tanglefoot is available at um, most hardware stores, um, not all, but uh, Southern States, um, I think Tractor Supply might have it, Lowe's, Southern Roots in Mount Holly, I know carries it, uh, Home Depot. Um, if you look online, you can probably find it. Sometimes it comes in these combo packs where it has a little bit of uh, like paper or batting um, to put around the tree. That would only work uh, on a small tree that uh, has thin bark. Uh, this type of batting it just um, doesn't create a good seal that the adult female uh, couldn't get under. There are some other products um, on the market. This is one called Bug Barrier. Um, it, you can look at it up online. The, and it's also available at some, a landscaping company called Site One. There's one in Gastonia. Um, I think there's one in Monroe and um, maybe in Cabarrus County in Concord. So um, it's easier to apply than the process I talked about at the three step process because it already has a sticky uh, band uh, that you can staple on and then you can peel off the plastic uh, off of the, or you pe peel off the paper and the sticky part is the plastic. So um, what you could do is just put it on your tree and then when it's time to, uh, to remove or, or time for the adults to come out, you can just take that paper off and uh, have a ready to go uh, band there that's sticky. Downsides of it are um, that it is somewhat prone to squirrel damage because when the tree, when the squirrels crawl, run up the tree, their claws often knock this uh, banding down. Um, also, the stickiness is not quite as good as tangle, applying the tangle foot. It might only last for uh, four to six weeks, which if you time it right, might be enough. It's also a bit more expensive. Uh, process, but it is easier uh, and not quite as messy as applying the tangle foot yourself. There are some other products uh, such as Catchmaster, which is a um, it's a rodent uh, stick uh, glue that you can put around uh, baseboards and things to catch rodents. It does work. It doesn't stay sticky as long as tangle foot. Um, and this is, these are just backups because about a year, uh, two years ago, the co company that made Tanglefoot went out of business for a while and was bought up by someone else and there was a shortage of Tanglefoot. So we were looking for alternative products. Uh, one alternative uh, some people have tried is Vaseline. It might work for a day uh, as long as it is cold. As soon as it gets warm, it melts and runs down the tree. So uh, that is not a useful product. It's interesting if you go back in time just to realize that this problem has been going on for a long time, for decades. This is from the 1918 USDA Department of Agriculture uh, Farm Bulletin. And it is a recipe for making the sticky Tanglefoot-like material. It's basically made of rosin and castor oil. So if you were going to um, create a whole bunch of uh, go into business and ban a lot of trees um, and needed a lot of sticky material, there is a recipe out there for you to create that product to yourself. Here are a few other tools of the trade. This on the left hand side is some cotton batting. It's actually a, like a, a polyester cotton uh, combination. And I think I got that from Faust's Warehouse in Kings Mountain, where you can buy um, just excess uh, surplus wholesale rolls of uh, textile products. It's pretty affordable. 
also on the right hand side there you see tar paper which you can get from any um, home home depot lowe's uh, center um, and what i did was just buy that whole uh, roll of it there and use a circular saw and just cut a uh, cut um, a six inch strip of it off and use that to band the trees a few other tools of the trade here you've got um, on the left hand side as i mentioned when you're spreading these uh, you could use a putty um, applicator uh, like you see up at the top here, but I recommend using paint sticks because you can spread that tangle foot uh, and it'll get all over your stick. And then at the end of the, your application, you can throw those away. And it's, it is really difficult to wash materials, including your hands. So buy some latex gloves, uh, disposable that you can wear while you're applying the tangle foot. Um, you'll need a staple gun to uh, staple on the cotton batting and the tar paper. There are these products here, the tree wrap, um, if you've got smaller trees. And as I, um, I mentioned, the uh, Gorilla Tape or the duct tape as a way of sealing um, or replacing staples. A roll of plastic wrap like this over on the right hand side is useful. Uh, for your smaller trees or any tree that has smooth bark. Um, it's uh, easier to apply than your, um, than it would be to put on the tar paper. You wouldn't need uh, as many staples. You could just wrap this around tight and then put the, the uh, tape on there and hold it. But again, it's only gonna work on trees that don't have rough bark and grooves. So how much banding material do you need? Um, if you do a little math from eighth grade, uh, two times pi or pi r, uh, two pi r, um, or pi times your diameter. So if you just measure the diameter and multiply it by three, 4.14, um, that will give you an idea of how much banding material, the length of the banding material. Just as an example, how widely it varies, if you have a large tree like in the top that has a 38 inch diameter, you're talking about eight feet of circumference. If you're talking about a smaller tree with um, an eight inch diameter, uh, you might be talking about uh, only two feet of uh, circumference. So. Take a look at your trees, kind of figure out how much material you need before you go shopping. The last question we often get is, okay, so I was successful. I banded my trees. I've got all this mess in the springtime because all you see all these female canker worms got caught on your tangle foot, did not lay their eggs up in your tree. You did a good job. When do I remove this? Can I, use, can I leave it up all year long? And the answer is no, you don't wanna leave it up all year long because you're gonna create an environment under the banding that might be uh, in inviting to other pests and diseases. So you do wanna remove this. Uh, you can remove it any time from um, mid-March through April. Um, at, you, it, there's some debate about whether to leave it up uh, during the, when the canker worms emerge, some people like to leave it up to uh, catch a few of the the, uh, the caterpillars as they're crawling around. Um, others say that it also catches some of the predatory insects that can control canker worms. So uh, there's no definite right answer on that, but you do want to remove it um, definitely by uh, mid to late April. I appreciate you joining us today. If you are still looking for some other resources, here are some links you can look up or you can just Google NCSU canker worms. There's a good pub publication. As I mentioned, Charlotte Mecklenburg has good resources. They've been battling this uh, canker worm war for a while so that you can uh, look up their resources. 
Keep Gastonia Beautiful has um, the kits. And then the guy I mentioned, Jack McNeary, uh, if you're interested in, in uh, reading his log on how he has fought canker worms in the Charlotte area, uh, that's uh, definitely worth a, a view there. Appreciate everybody uh, joining us today. If you have any questions, feel free to give us a call at the Gaston County Extension Office at 704-922-2111. Uh, you can ask for me. Or if you uh, live in another county, uh, you can call the Lincoln County Extension Office or Catawba County Extension Office or wherever you live in, in your county, they do have an extension office to serve you. We appreciate you joining us today and look forward to uh, success with our canker worms this year.